there. Hebrews chapter 10. So last week, we spent our time together discussing the sacrifice of Jesus. How it is a a once and for all sacrifice that has fully brought in the promises of the new covenant. So look at um, last week, the last verse we covered was verse 18. So look at verse 16 with me. This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws upon their heart and on their mind, and I will write them. Then you look at verse 17. And their sins and lawless deeds I will remember no more. Verse 18. Now where there is forgiveness of these things, there is no longer any offering for sin. So that is a good summary of what we covered last week. That the once and for all sacrifice of Christ has brought in these new covenant promises. Where God places His law, He imprints them on the very heart of His people, and He remembers their sins no more. Um, Bringing His people in that perfected state before the Holy Father. And because of that, there's no longer a need for additional sacrifices. It has been the once and for all sacrifice. So, with that in mind, the reason I wanted to bring that up is because here in verse 19, we see a shift where what follows is the proper response God's people should have to that reality, to that truth of Jesus' sacrifice. So, so just a quick note for, for us as God's people. When we're studying Scripture, um, take notice that here in Hebrews and all throughout our Scriptures, um, when a promise of God, when a truth of God, a reality is identified, Um, What follows more often than not is the proper response God's people should have in light of that truth. So here, after we learn about the sacrifice of Christ and what it has brought us, verse 19 moves into the response. And it says, Therefore, brethren, since we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he inaugurated for us, through the veil that is his flesh. And since we have a great high priest over the house of God. I want to stop there for a moment. He is setting the stage for the main point that he is about to make in verse 22. Um, But let's look at these uh, truths that he identifies for us in Christ. In verse 19, what is it that we should have if we are in Christ? Confidence. And confidence for what? Enter the holy place. You think about the audience of the book of Hebrews, how the writer time and time again is pointing back to the the emblems of the old covenant and showing us how in Christ these, um, these things were simply a shadow of what has now come in Christ. So you think about under the old covenant, the holy place, it's where God's presence was. No man or woman could go into that presence other than the high priest. But now he says that this this radical, earth-shattering statement that if we are in Christ, not only can we go into that holy place, but in fact we should have confidence to do so. Look at verse 20. What else has Jesus brought us? A new and living way. The way things were of old, those things are gone, and now there is a new way that man can relate to God. And he says that this isn't just a new way, but it's what? It is a living way. Religion, our religion, our faith, it's not dead, it's not archaic, It's not ancient, but it's something that is still active and alive today, just like God's Word is living and active today. So you think about it, why is it that our faith is still living? How is that so? Because our Savior is living, right? You think about... um, Every movement that's ever existed in this 
on this earth. The starter of the movement begins it, and then he dies, and it's over. And oftentimes, soon after, the movement dies with the person. What makes what Christ brought so radically different is not only did he live, but once he died, he rose to never die again. He's at the right hand of the Father in the presence of God, and the promise is that he's made a way for his people, a new and living way, where they can be brought into that presence as well. In verse 20, it says that um, he inaugurated for us through his veil. Maybe your translation says through the curtain. What is that in reference to? What's the veil? What's the curtain? The tabernacle, right? You remember there's two veils. Um, the general public, all they can see when they come into the tabernacle is the veil. And they know that they're not granted access beyond that veil because if they do, what will happen to them? They will die. We've talked about it before in Hebrews, but it's, it's such a key theme that the, the radical, supreme holiness of God you can think of countless examples in the Old Testament. My, my one that I go to the most is um, when, when Moses is receiving the law from the Lord. Um, he, he's having an exchange with God on the mountain. And that is so, so holy that they're commanded to not even touch the mountain. Because if a man, beast, animal touches the mountain, they will literally die. Um, because sinful man cannot come into the presence of a holy God on their own. So what does that tell us that if that was the way things have been for all human history, and now we're told not only come into God's presence, but to come with confidence, what does that tell us about how significant and powerful the sacrifice of our Lord was? Um, what has it accomplished for us? Yes, Juanita. Right. It's a good point. You remember when um, Jesus died on the cross. You think about the events that took place at that moment. Remember the, the sky goes dark, the ground shakes, dead arise, and what's the other thing that happens? The veil split in two. Um, what was that to communicate? Um, that... That demonstrated once and for all that the barrier that existed between God and man has been completely obliterated through Christ. And that um, access to God and his presence is now available to all who come to the Son uh, because he's made the new and living way. Yes. Right. You know, that, that's a good point. When I, um, uh, we know that, you know, you, sometimes you read scripture and you see the response of the people and you think, man, how could they be so, so out of touch? You know, we would like to think if we were there, um, we would respond differently, but we know that's, that's not true. Uh, humans, humans are the same then that they are today and we would have been prey to the same things. But when I look at uh, when Jesus died, you know, the moment he dies, the sky goes dark, the earth is rumbling. The veil is split in an unnatural way that the only explanation is it's divine. And now on top of it all, there are people literally rising out of the grave. And then it says uh, at that moment, one of the centurions who put Jesus to death goes, man, surely that was the Son of God. And I always think, well, no, duh. <laughs> you know, it's like uh, that he's only been saying that for, you know, three whole, whole years and um, it's inter it shows just the links that God was going through to communicate what had just taken place. Um, so here in our, our passage in, in Hebrews, um, it says that this veil was torn through his flesh, which is just the way to communicate through his sacrifice. Verse 21, And since we have a great high priest over the house of God. For us in the New Covenant, what is the house of God? 
where is it that God dwells today? In us and in his people. And it's not a, when we come to this building, God is here, like this building is special. This is just a building. Um, but the beauty of the new covenant, through the, the promised giving of the Spirit, which was a promise of the new covenant, is that God's presence is with his people continually. And when God's people get together, God's presence is with them collectively. Um, and he says that now we have a high priest who is over that house. We all collectively have the same high priest who is interceding on our behalf and who has made that new and living way where we can come before the Father with confidence. That's a lot of blessings, isn't it? Just in three little verses. And now what's the point? Why does he bring all of this up? Verse 22. Let us draw near with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith having our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. What is the response? Hmm. If the, the response that they're after is, that the response that we're instructed to have is to draw near to God with full assurance of faith. What does that require of us? If we're going to do that, what is required? Obedience. What else? Baptism. That's what's addressed next. What else? Sincerity. Right? That's what it says. And then what's the, other, the last thing that's identified from this passage? Full assurance of faith. And in that comes everything that was just said, right? If, if we fully have an, you know, an assurance of faith in the promises of God, that means we respond in obedience. We respond in baptism. We respond in sincerity. Um, so notice what's identified in this passage, and it's something that I think is very um, convicting for me, and I hope for you as well, that... If we don't have confidence to come before God, what does that signify that we lack? Faith. Sometimes you hear statements like, you know, maybe you hear a, a prayer and it's, Lord, we hope that one day you'll save us. Lord, we hope that you'll hear our prayer. Um, not criticizing the person who says that. I know they don't mean anything by it, but when you hear statements like that, um, I don't think when you come to a passage like this that, that we are instructed that those are prayers that should be on our lips, right? Um, because the idea is if we have full assurance of faith in the promises of God, we know he has saved us. We know he does hear our prayer, that he has forgiven us, um, that, that we have a high priest who is interceding on our behalf. Um, that if we don't have confidence to come before God, that we don't feel like we can come before him with our troubles and requests, we don't feel like we are forgiven and that the deeds of our past are done away with and God remembers them no more, that is a, a lack of faith. Um, and that's something that I think is helpful for us to, to remember. Um, that no matter no matter what we personally feel about who we are, what we've done, you know, we don't forget the things from the past that we've done that's wrong. But if we are going to be in Christ, if we are still holding on to things that God says He has forgiven long ago and He remembers no more, um, we need to increase our faith. We need to increase our faith. And He says here that to those who draw near to God, the idea is if you draw near to God, what happens? What? He draws near to you. That is a promise of Scripture. To those who reach out to find their way to Him, He meets them there. Um, that's Acts. If you, if you draw near to God, that is when you are receiving and living out the blessings of God. And that's what God is after. Here He talks about um, when we draw near, having our 
our hearts sprinkled clean with an evil conscience. Um, you think back to chapter 9 where it talks about, you know, if the blood of bulls and goats could purify the flesh, how much more can the blood of Christ purify your conscience from dead works? Um, it's the same idea. It's almost the same language where he says here, to those who are in Christ, the blood of Christ has purified your heart. Your conscience should be clear um, because the, the works of the flesh, the dead works of your past have been forgiven. God remembers them no more. And then taking it a step further, he says, having your bodies washed with pure water. Um, remember, he's not saying that in our baptism that um, it's some special water that we have in the baptistry that you don't have in your faucet. Um, we, we know from you know, places like 1 Peter 3.21 when you're baptized, it's not a removal of dirt from the flesh. It's not special water. It's an appeal to God um, for a good conscience. So what is he talking about? Well, again, he's, he's drawing on the, the Old Testament, Old coven, Covenant language. Well, when they did rituals, it was commanded they did it with pure water. So here he is, he's teaching us that when we're baptized, we are, we are washed. We are made pure. Uh, but we know we are washed and made pure by what? By the blood of Christ. Um, we're not going to go there for the sake of time, but if you're taking notes, um, write down Acts 22.16. Um, that's where we get the language of the washing, the forgiveness of sins that we receive at baptism. Um, that we're washed um, not by special water, but we're washed by, by the blood of Christ in that moment of baptism. And then verse 23, he continues the, the application. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. Verse 24. And let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds. What we see in this passage is language like this about holding fast, drawing near, endurance, confidence, these are kind of the, the key words that keep coming up. If you hear that, that phrase, when he says, hold fast your confession, what thoughts come to your mind? What, what do you think that is in reference to? What does that mean? Absolutely. That's a good illustration. Um, we see from this passage as we go along the, the um, price that many of the Christians here have faced due to their faith, the, the, the cost, the very real persecution they faced. Uh, we'll see it in verses uh, 31 through 33. Um, and here he is reminding them of all of the blessings that are in Christ, showing them that no matter what's going on, he is worth holding on to. Um, he's worth enduring any difficulty in this life. And he's imploring them to hold fast to that confession. What is the confession? Jesus is who he said he was. He accomplished what he said he accomplished. All of these promises of Christ, confessing he is my high priest, he is my once and for all sacrifice, we're holding on to that white knuckle grip and we're not letting go. Um, yes. Right. Well, and I, I think that is one of the um, components of the gospel that, that our world has the most difficulty with, especially as Americans, where um, we have a lot of pride, where we think, you know, we're all relatively good people, good and decent, decent people, um, who just need a little help here and there. But when we come to the gospel, 
we get a, a much different picture of the heart of man, don't we? Where we see we, we desperately need a Savior. And to, to hold tight to the confession means that you are confessing, I am a sinner who is in desperate need of grace. And without my Savior, I am completely and utterly bankrupt and lost. Um, I, I think that is a... That is a uh, fundamental truth that we have to accept if we're going to come to Christ. And I've I found that that is a big hurdle in um, sharing the gospel with others. This idea that you have a Savior you need to hold on to when, when we're taught self-sufficiency. You know, we don't need anybody. All I need is the, the work of my hands, the, um, the labor that I, I put in. But continuing on, um, he says that for he, the reason we can hold on, the reason we can continue in the hope of our confession is because he who promised is faithful. The one who has told us if we obey this covenant that he will bless us in these various ways, he says that is a God who at the very core of his character is faithfulness. He doesn't go back on his word. Um, even in unstable times, he's still stable. And that even when his people become faithless, he remains faithful. That's, that's found in 1 Timothy. Um, that, that's at the, the core of who our God is, that he is dependable and he is trustworthy. And he's demonstrated that once and for all through the cross, um, where, where his faithfulness is on full display. Any thoughts on that before we continue on? So remember what we were implored to do in verses 22 and 23. Draw near with full faith and sincerity and hold fast to Christ in the confession because that's important for what we're about to cover next. Verse 24, he says to consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds. That part of belonging to the household of God, like we just spoke about a few verses above, Part of being a part of God's new covenant in Christ is that it's not just about me and my relationship with God, is it? But it's about my relationship with God and my relationship with his people. Think about in the religious world today, you hear buzz terms like a personal relationship with Jesus, right? Or something along those lines. And the idea is all you need is Jesus and, and when you hear that phrase, that, that sounds good on the surface, but what is often meant by that is you don't need the church, you don't need God's people, you don't need other Christians who might annoy you and might be difficult to deal with. All you need is that personal relationship with Christ. We find no such picture of the new covenant in Scripture. But the idea is that we are saved as individuals who respond to that new covenant, to respond to Christ, but then once we are saved, what are we brought into? The household of God. The household of faith. Um, God's, the, the body of, of Christ. right? And that when Christ returns, who is he coming to save? He's not coming to save individuals. He's coming to save his church. Um, that's the idea. And here it's no wonder that we see the collective responsibility we have as God's covenant people. It is that we are looking for ways to stir one, one another to good deeds. The idea being that we're always taking the opportunities to encourage each other in the things of the Lord. And then we move into verse 25. Not forsaking our own assembling together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. How many times have you heard that passage in your life? Um, it's a well-known passage, I'm sure. But let's make sure we're always considering verses in their, in their context. And notice that the first word of verse 25 is not. Um, it's not a standalone sentence in verse 25. It's connected to what's been addressed before. And when he's talking about the importance of drawing near to God, He's talking about the importance of holding on to your faith, the importance of God's people together and encouraging each other in the things of the Lord. That is when he moves to say, make sure you are not forsaking the assembly. Make sure that you, as, 
as God's people, recognize the responsibility you have to God and to one another. But it's important to point out in verse 25 that forsaking the assembly does not, this is not um, the Hebrew writer saying if you miss a, a church service that you have completely lost your salvation. But it is the word forsaken, another way to translate that is abandon. The idea is you were holding on to Christ like you were told to, holding on to the confession, and you've let go. You were drawing near to God, and now you're going in the opposite direction. The idea is that you no longer walk with the Lord. You no longer value what He has to offer. You no longer place any value on God and His people in assembling together with them. Yes. And right, and um, I think everyone here can relate with some experience like that. Um, and I, I, I want to say um, I've tried to walk sensitively over issues like this because the desire to be together with God's people, um, when people maybe took that a little too far, you see where it's coming from at least, where um, at least there is a desire there to be with God's people. And you can respect that. You can value that. But the problem is when we, we bind things on people that God never bound. Um, because that is what, that's pharisaical, right? They tie up heavy burdens, place them on others' backs, even though they themselves do not carry those burdens themselves. Um, that's the problem. Yes? Right. And homes. Mm -hmm. Right. Agreed. Well, and that's, that's the thing is, is it true that church attendance can be a reflector of your spiritual well-being? Absolutely, right? If you haven't been to the assembly in eight weeks, you know, and it's not because of some, you know, catastrophe that's happened in your life, yeah, that, that's probably an indicator that something has went wrong. But um, it's just important that we recognize the main point that's being communicated here. The main point that's being communicated is do not abandon your Lord. Hold fast to the confession. Even in difficulty, don't allow, um, don't forget what you should value most. And here, look, we see that what's taking place, why the Hebrew writer um, is even addressing this issue. He says, as is the habit of some. He says, there are those who are professing the name of Christ, but, who do not va but they do not value his people. They have little desire to assemble together, and they have no desire to encourage one another as they see the day drawing near. They're not concerned about stirring one, each up, one another up. Uh, there's, a, there's a selfishness there. Um, there is an entitlement. There isn't a recognition of the responsibility God's people have to one another. And, and most of all, there is a failure to value what they should value most, which is their Lord. Any thoughts on that? Yeah. Right. Agreed. Well, that's the, that's the principle. You know, weep with those who weep, mourn with those who mourn, rejoice with those who rejoice. It's the idea that if one part of your body is damaged, your whole body's damaged. 
if one part of your body's healthy, your whole body's healthy. It's, there's this, this interconnectedness um, that we as God's people are meant to, to have and share in this life. Um, I think that's the heart of what's being addressed here. Um, does, is church attendance absolutely crucial to spiritual growth in our faith? Of course. But what is being emphasized here is not someone who misses a service, but someone who in their heart has turned away from the Lord. That's the, the factor. Uh, that's the issue. Yes. Right. Hmm. Well, and that's, that's one thing that... Um, Kaylee and I have talked about much at our time in college where we would go to college where a lot of these, um, excuse me, we would go to, to the assembly where the large majority of people there would be college kids. Um, and you would hear language like that a lot, you know. If, if the, their favorite speaker didn't speak that day, you know, they would say, well, I just didn't really get anything out of that. Or if the song service wasn't as excellent as it was in the past, you know, well, that just wasn't really all that beneficial to me. And there's just these comments all the time about me, me, me when we come together. And what I kind of always wanted to say in those moments was, well, good thing that we're not here for you. Um, like, you're not here for me. And um, I think that's easy to forget, that our, our assembly isn't just about us and what we get out of it, but it's about what we give, what we give to the Lord and what we, we give to, to one another as God's people. Um, I know you guys know that. I'm not going to go on the, the soapbox about that. Um, so let's continue on. Yes. Right. Well, and that, that's a good point, because I remember sometimes growing up that... Um, Especially, I grew up in a small congregation. And uh, so if someone wasn't there, you knew it. You knew everyone who was there, everyone who wasn't. And um, if someone wasn't there, sometimes it, maybe they miss a week or two. And the, the, the jump would always almost be gossip, speculation, talking about, well, so-and-so wasn't there. They, I wonder why. And if we took things like this passage seriously, what would our response be when we notice our brother and sister aren't there? We would reach out to them, right? Wouldn't assume the worst. We would reach out to them to see, do you have needs that I can meet? Is there something that I can help you with? Are you weak right now? Do I need some burden I can bear for you? Um, that's the response. Not to be puffed up and self-righteous because we didn't miss and they did. Um, but we need to move on. Verse 26, so again, as Judy said, it's the habit that's emphasized, and then here in verse 26, this is a passage that you've probably studied, you've probably heard, but it's important that we remember to keep it in its context. He's not talking about generally any sin in this situation, but he's talking about what, was just, what has just been addressed. So in verse 26, it says, For if we go on sinning willfully after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sin. So he just talked about, bye. Uh, they just talked about, oh, that's okay. <laughs> um, he just talked about forsaking, which again means abandoning our Lord. And he talks about the habit, which is we are continually not valuing God or his people. And then here he says, if we go on sinning willfully. So what sin is he specifically talking about? What we just addressed, right? He says, so we've received the knowledge, we've responded to it, but now we have abandoned it. We've walked away from it and we're doing it intentionally and willfully. He says, what is our state if that is what we're doing? There's no longer sacrifice. That sacrifice that we spent so much time talking about last week and all the blessings that come with it, he says that, that is the sacrifice that brings us with confidence before the God of the universe. He says, 
when we willfully turn our back on the Lord and abandon Him, we go our own way. We don't value Him. We value ourselves more. He says that sacrifice no longer is available to you. And no, excuse me, that's not accurate. It is available to you, but you have left it, and it's not covering you anymore. Um, and then verse 27. But a terrifying expectation of judgment and the fury of a fire which will consume the adversaries. This is a very sobering passage. Um, if we are in Christ, we think about our relationship with God. We are received. We are, as Romans 8, as Brent's been covering, um, as it would say it, we are adopted as sons and daughters. Quite literally in that passage, we get to call God our, our father. Our, and in that passage, it's dad. It's the term of endearment for a young child to, to a parent. Um, that is our, our relationship with God in Christ. It says, But to those, after all he's done for them, no longer values him. They forsake him. They abandon him. They let go, and they go their own way. It says, even though we've been given the ability to be a son and a daughter, we are going to face the fate of the adversaries, of the enemies. Um, you think about, in the writings of Paul, how so often he talks about our state before we came to Christ. And he talks about um, the hostility that existed between us and God due to our sin. If we respond to the sacrifice of Christ and we're covered by it, and then that sacrifice no longer remains because we've abandoned it. Um, that means we go back under that state of hostility where the, the fate of the enemies of God will be the fate of those who walked away from him and abandoned him, um, which is a, a very, very sobering and yet important reminder. Um, and he, he adds on to this thought in verse 28. Anyone who has set aside the law of Moses dies without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. How much more severe punishment do you think will be deserved? Excuse me. Do you think he will deserve who has trampled underfoot the Son of Man and has regarded as unclean the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified and has insulted the Spirit of grace? The point he's making you look at the old law, the law of Moses, that we know, according to Hebrews, was just a, a shadow of the things that are come, to come. But this new covenant is superior in Christ. And he says if you look at that imperfect, um, that imperfect law that could not fully save and deal with sin, he says if people abandon it, they went their own way, he says they, they would die, and it would be without mercy. He says... How much more severe do you think the punishment will be justly warranted to those who abandon the superior law, the superior sacrifice, the superior covenant that's found in Christ? And he says specifically that when we abandon and forsake our Lord, we let go of Him, he says that we, are, we have regarded the blood of that covenant, that perfect blood of Christ, as unclean. In Hebrews, it talks also about trampling it underfoot. We place no, if you trample something underfoot, what's the idea? It's not a value, right? It's like the salt that's no longer um, salty. Throw it out, it's trampled underfoot. It's of no value. And he says, we've insulted the spirit of grace. And notice, the spirit of what? Of grace. God has given us the grand invitation through his son. Entrance into a covenant, a relationship, a blessedness that is beyond anything we could ever deserve. And he will be so um, unimaginably good and gracious to those who accept his, his son, respond in faith and obedience to him. But do we see how serious he takes those who have seen everything that he's offered? They know everything he's offered and they don't value it. Or they did value it at one point, and then they no longer do, and they've walked away. God takes that very seriously. And if God takes something very seriously, what should his people do? 
taken very seriously. Um, that's why we place such a great emphasis on continually looking to Christ, continually drawing our, our, our faith in him and, and deepening it. Because you think about the process of abandoning Christ. Think about what it looks like to be walking with the Lord and to do that no longer, to, to not hold fast to the confession but to let go. That doesn't happen in an instant, does it? That does not happen. All, you're walking with Christ faithfully, and then all of a sudden you're not. A lot of little decisions, a lot of tiny things that take us just a little further away until one day we look up and we've no, we haven't been with the Lord in a really long time. Um, that is why Scripture talks so much about where our mind is set, where our heart dwells, evaluating ourselves by the Word of God because we're all susceptible to drifting and we're all susceptible to doing exactly what this passage says. Um, and for that reason, that is why I think what is emphasized in this passage as well is our brothers and sisters in Christ. Why we're encouraging one another in the things of the Lord. Because left to our own devices, we can go astray. And we need that help to make sure we are on the right path and going in the direction of our Lord. Any thoughts on that? Yes. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. So no wonder that's the direction you go. Right. which is how it almost always happens, right? Has there been anyone who's made a colossal, monumental mistake who um, would have chosen to do that, right? Nobody destroys their life on purpose, um, but it's a lot of little decisions where you, you make compromises here and there and time after time after time until you end up in a place that you never expected. That's how sin operates, right? Um, it's, it promises more than it can deliver, and it costs more than we're ever thinking we're going to have to pay. Um, verse 30. For we know him who said, Vengeance is mine, I will repay. So we'll stop there for a moment. This is a, a, a passage that is quoted in the New Testament. It's various points. Um, probably the place we know what most we're most familiar with is in Romans 12 where um, he talks about the marks of a true Christian. And he talks about don't repay evil for evil um, but it, um, because vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. And in that case, he's talking about Christians dealing with evil people, sinful people, worldly people. And he's saying we have no right to be in the vengeance game. Because we're blinded by our own sin, our own selfishness, our own pride. There's only one who can justly um, repay people for their crimes, and it's God. But here, notice he's not talking about the vengeance he will repay towards the world, towards those on the outside. What comes next? And again, the Lord will judge his people to all who have abandoned his son, they will be judged just like the rest of the world will be. Um, just like those 
who have never responded to the Lord. Um, that will be the fate of those who um, no longer walk with the Lord, abandon Him, don't hold fast. And he says in verse 31, the, the summary of what he's addressing, it is a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of a living God. To those who've abandoned the Son, they will have to explain to God why they quit, what they valued more than their son. They'll have to give an account um, for why it is they, they thought that whatever they pursued was, was more valuable than what Jesus had made available to them. And that is a message directly to those in Christ, imploring them, do not give up on our high priest, our Savior, our sacrifice. This isn't a new idea. Um, quickly, let's look at Colossians 1. In Colossians 1, verse 21. Colossians 1, 21. And although you were formerly alienated and hostile in mind, engaged in evil deeds... Yet he, <clears throat> excuse me, yet he has now reconciled you in his fleshly body through, the, through death in order to present you before him holy and blameless and beyond reproach. If indeed you continue in the faith, firmly established and steadfast, and not moved away from the hope of the gospel that you have heard, which was proclaimed in all creation under heaven, of which I, Paul, was made a minister." Verse 21, our state before we came to Christ, we are hostile. We are aliens. We have no part with the Lord, and the only thing we've accumulated for ourselves from Him is the just wrath that our sin has incurred. He says, but now through Christ, through His fleshly body, which is His sacrifice, He says we can be presented before Him holy, blameless, beyond reproach. The idea being that you can be presented before the holy God with not a hint of sin in you. But what is asked of us in return? If indeed you continue in the faith, firmly established, steadfast, not moved. See, you hear that same language that, that we heard in Hebrews? The idea of holding on, endurance, here it is. God asks, he says, you can be holy, blameless, presented before me without any sin in the picture. He says, but all I ask is that you hold on in faith with steadfastness, not moved away, valuing me and my son above anything else. Yes, Judy. Right. Right. Now that's a good point. Um, you think about Jesus when those in the crowd are coming to him and say, um, I'll follow you wherever I go. I believe this is in Luke 9 also. It talks about um, foxes have holes. Birds have nests. The Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Um, one guy, uh, Jesus calls to follow him, and he says, first let me go bury my father. Uh, another man says he'll follow Jesus and, and says, but first let me, me go and look at the, the cattle that, that I've bought. In those instances, maybe we read that and think, man, Jesus, Jesus was harsh. The guy just wants to bury his father. The guy just wants to go say bye to his family. The guy just wants to go look at his cattle. Um, what is the point Jesus is trying to communicate? If you knew what was being offered to you right now, there is nothing you would value more than it. There is nothing you would value more. Um, not even the most pressing earthly 
physical need. And I think that's a sobering reminder when we come back to this passage that, that God has given us something that is so beyond what we could deserve. And even though he himself needs nothing from us, we have nothing that God needs. God is just fine whether we choose to follow him or not. And yet, look at the lengths he went to to bring us back to himself. Because even though you don't deserve it, even though I don't need anything from you, I love you. And I want what's best for you. I want you to be blessed in my son. And ultimately, I want to be with you for eternity. And if, if God has went to that great of links to bring us back to him, no wonder he is deeply offended by those who see all of that, they participate in it, they experience it, and then they say, you know what? Something else is more important to me than this. And I think that's where we should, should leave it, uh, leave, stop on that thought. Um, in our own hearts, let's always make sure when we read a passage like this that our mind doesn't automatically go to someone else that we know who we think might have done this. We don't go to someone else who might be susceptible to this. Let, let's be honest before the Lord with ourselves um, and recognize we're all susceptible of falling into this, this trap because we're all susceptible to sin. And let us prayerfully and humbly before the Lord repent. Repent of the times that we value things other than His Son. And, and come back to Him with a, a resolve that we say, um, the faith I have in Your Son, the confession that I, I have in him, he said, and saying, I'm going to hold on to that. I'm going to endure. I'm going to hold that up in the highest esteem, and nothing is going to make me compromise um, my allegiance to, to you. Let's have a word of prayer, and then we'll be finished. Father, thank you so much for the time in your word. Thank you for the sacrifice of your son that can present us before you holy and blameless and, and beyond reproach. Thank you for the promises of the covenant where our sins are remembered no more, that our eternal salvation is secure. Father, we know the only thing that can prohibit us from experiencing those things are ourself. We're thankful that you're gracious towards us, Lord. Please let us never be those who Abandon your son, who don't value what he's brought us, who let go. We pray at this time that you strengthen our resolve to hold true, to endure, to value Christ. In Jesus' name, amen.